Well, I knew from the beginning that uh, I would be the one writing the text, but I didn't want to be the one who films it all. That would be way too obnoxious. So I started by um, um, challenging seven top cinematographers from seven parts of the world uh, into uh, trying to film nothing in a documentary way. And I didn't know them by then. Uh, I didn't know them then, but uh, I basically showed the list of the six other participants to everyone at the same time, and they all said yes simultaneously. So suddenly I had seven, you know, top uh, Oscar, Cannes, Berlinale winning cinematographers playing my game. But uh, in fact, they didn't. Um, they really didn't deliver. They freaked out by all this responsibility and by all this freedom I gave them. So I ended up uh, shifting to people who were genuinely more motivated to play this game. And that was uh, actually uh, colleagues of mine, cinematographers from all over the world, and even uh, students of mine, uh, again, from, from all kinds of different backgrounds. And the idea was to have like as many different backgrounds, aesthetical, cultural, um, technical, uh, personal, um, you know, as many people as possible trying to weave together this mosaic of, of a universal picture of, uh, of, uh, of nothing. And um, yeah, we, I divided, we played in, in five stages, like in the beginning they had complete freedom and gradually they had more and more uh, uh, instructions uh, from me, and in the meantime, they could watch and, and, and comment the footage of each other, but without ever knowing who filmed what and who said what. It was an anonymous uh, brainstorming process um, online. So, yeah, I mean, in the end, uh, it was a very rich and intense uh, exchange of ideas and footage, uh, at the end mm -hmm. of which uh, we had, you know, 62 cinematographers who uh, filming this one film, and it all looks like it was done by one, one person, actually. So, yeah. so it kind of worked out. Um, well, I mean, again, I, I also, uh, from, from the very beginning, I knew that I would want it, that I could hypothetically challenge anyone into performing this role. I mean, who would refuse to, who wouldn't be intrigued at least to, uh, to, 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 to play the role of nothing. So I had no idea who that person would be. And only after seven and a half years into production, I accidentally stumbled upon a, actually a video of Iggy Pop singing a, 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 a duet in French, a Jacques Brel song with, uh, with a young French lady. And I thought that he, I mean, he, you know, there's my my last remaining childhood rock and roll hero, um, you know, in better shape than ever and manifesting and representing exactly the type of character they wanted, that I wanted my nothing uh, to be in the film. You know, this kind of uh, um, misunderstood uh, anti-hero, childish, uh, slightly decadent, witty, energetic, resilient, uh, poignant. So, um, you know, in this game of, uh, of infinite impossibilities, that is this film, I, I, I told myself, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I challenge? Why wouldn't I basically ask, try to get to Iggy? And it started by me asking my, telling my friend, hey guys, you know, this film I'm kind of making for all these years, well, it's, um, it's going to be narrated by Iggy Pop, and actually, um, uh, thank God somebody took me seriously, and they uh, uh, and they and, and they said, "Oh, I, I know one technician at one of his concerts in France, a friend of ours who was doing that." So through that technician, you know, through these seven degrees of separation, I got into contact with his uh, French manager and. With a few uh, gypsy negotiation tricks, I managed to convince him to uh, uh, to to show the proposal to Iggy, and Iggy accepted uh, straight on, spot on. And um, and yeah, we had this one recording session, like super professional. It was great and and, 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 and funny and very understanding and and extremely you know 
efficient and uh, yeah i mean he 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 loved the he loved the whole thing i asked him at the at the end of the session how it felt for him and he said one memorable line he said uh, this was like something from the renaissance or something I mean, there is some element of of, uh, of Slavic or Serbian or Balkan or uh, whatever southern um, humor uh, and, and character and uh, discourse in, in into this. But I think I think what's what's more important in your comment is that you pointed out to this uh, the playfulness of, of contradiction and this desire to. Uh, and this desire to, to try to tackle and tame complexity instead of uh, banalizing it and simplifying it. I think that's that's what I that's one of the things that I try to do in this film. It is an overwhelming film, uh, but you know the topic is overwhelming, and you know I think we shouldn't shy away from that, and we should you know I, I try to make it as accessible as possible. This film is really best understood when it is read again. I printed this little uh, libretto of the film in which you can actually, you know, read the film again mm -hmm. and watch it again with a code at the end. And that's mm -hmm. where the film really is. But so it's basically like five films, um, uh, you know, 10 or 100 films, you know, packed into one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's still the same suggestion, you know, like how, you know, let's, let's all go out and, and try to see how how we could uh, uh, load a little bit uh, more appreciation of nothing mm -hmm. in our lives. I think it's a, it's an intellectual game, it's a psychological game, it's a crisis management game that we can all uh, benefit from, and it's absolutely uh, endless, you know, Slavic mm -hmm. or not. Amazed that uh, the reactions to this film throughout the world have been uh, almost identical in the sense that this film generates some sort of uh, uh, el elated confusion or like this sense of uh, consolation or the sense of like there's some some sort of a, a warm feel feeling of of content and of of um, acceptable fat fatalism fatalism. Um, which which really surprised me. I mean, it's, and this is why I I basically uh, you know and the the, the tagline of, uh, at the, on the poster it says an unlikely feel good documentary. I mean, I put this not before I made the film, but after after the the first you know five or ten festivals. Yeah, I actually saw uh, Baraka uh, in cinema in '93 when it was released in uh, in Canada. I was doing my studies in in Ottawa, so I saw it, you know, on a big screen over there. And yes, of course, like such a film, uh, it really leaves an impression on you. But for me, uh, I think those films played their uh, role in the history of cinema and which was very important at that time but I think we should move one step beyond or, 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 or on the side or whatever uh, and I really insisted in, on this addition of the voice I think this film without the text would have been uh, would have felt very old and, 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 and it would have been could have gone in, in many different directions uh, people would have thought about anything else except nothing. Um, I made a, a, an art museum 60-minute loop version without, uh, without narration. It's really immersive, it's nice, but you know, it's, it's actually just nice. I, mean, it's, I think beautiful images are so available today, or strange images, or, or, or rich images are, are so accessible today. You can, you, can, you can Google top 25 abandoned castles and then YouTube will just suggest like tens of hours of, of images like this, you know, automatically. So that's not the point. I think I think the, uh, I think strangely enough, after a hundred years, what cinema uh, really uh, uh, can 
can benefit from the most is 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 the added tax value, which is kind of ironic, but that's how that's how I feel. And the text, the text I wrote myself, the whole of it, after you know eight years of of a massive research, I say it's the most eclectic bibliography ever used in documentary film, all kinds of subjects, and it kept growing exponentially. I have enough books to read for for my next you know twenty lives, and it was just you know like it was just like falling in love with reading. And learning again, and basically you can reinterpret everything through, you know, through this special side angle of, of nothing. And um, and I knew from the beginning that I wanted to give this nothing a voice, and I wanted this nothing to be this kind of uh, misunderstood uh, kind of anti-angel or like strange. Uh, anti-hero, and um, but they had no idea how I, how I would write it and what this nothing would say. And thank God there was a script writing deadline. I, I received some some monies from uh, from a from a film center over here, and I got uh, and I had to deliver. And then I said, yeah, and then of course the the deadline showed up like in front of me, like in a you know. Oh, very suddenly, and I had to clear the table out of all this massive preparation and really uh, start writing from the top of my head. You know, what's the first thing nothing will tell us? Finally, finally, what? Finally, we meet. You know, finally, our first date. What happens on a date? Sometimes you arrive early, sometimes you arrive late. And then it also got, oh, well, well did nothing arrive early or late? That's already like the first uh, kind of almost metaphysical question. And then I amused myself in this state of desperation, um, being late for the deadline. I amused myself. Uh, I mean, I, I was really surprised that it started rhyming because I never intended it to rhyme. I never wrote any li two lines of poetry in my life before this, and I never planned to write it like that. It just that's how it came out from my head. And I really think uh, it's it's actually. Uh, the children bedtime books that I was reading at the time to my kids that that are to blame for for the style of this writing it probably was provided this safe matrix in my head of of uh, of uh, framing complexity into a simple into a seemingly simple form uh, and in an amazing mental twist I managed to block uh, what I call my I managed to suspend my self disbelief, and I wrote the whole thing in one night. Basically, I mean, in a, it all—it was like years of marination, and then it all poured out of my head in one kind of almost, you know, cosmic acceleration, which is one of the most exciting thing. I mean, the most exciting thing that happened to me in my whole life, basically. Uh, the visuals were were being filmed for seven years non-stop. Uh, I just wanted footage of nothing, whatever, whatever you know, sh documentary footage of nothing, whatever is nothing for the cinematographers. And I filmed myself like almost half of the film. But the idea was uh, that footage was on one side, and then the text came at the very end. And then I wrote the and recorded the narration, and uh, and basically was looking in a pile of, of, of footage what could fit where as a um, as a kind of illustration um, or a counterpoint to to this or that line um, uh, the, the, the translation was was made to rhyme throughout the film uh, in French uh, as well, and of course, you know, if you're trying to to keep a direct translation, which not only matches the the text but also the the, the rhythm of the voice, you have to have a little um, um, uh, a, a little free translation component uh, added to it. So, so I would say it 
matches whatever at eighty percent it is you know when you read it separately it works perfectly the problem is that you understand both english and french and that's why when you try to read and to listen to two languages rhyming at the same time your your head explodes basically so uh, in some languages the translation rhymes uh in in, in serbian in uh, russian in um, uh, in, in French, it rhymes fully from end to end. Uh, in, in 20 other languages, it doesn't rhyme. Uh, but uh, I, think, uh, I think the solution is to make it rhyme whenever it's natural and possible, and, uh, and to skip the rhyme when, when it goes too much into free translation. I think that's, 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 that's what will be the final... Um, uh, the final, the final, uh, the final subtitles will be like that. Um, as I said, it looks great. It feels great when you read it on paper, the rhyming in French. But it's not. Uh, it's schizophrenic when you listen to it together with the English. But on the other hand, if you read, all, if the translation is, is a direct translation from English, and if you just read it, it, it looks just awful. It, it's a very straightforward and badly written text. So it had to have some element of stylization, stylization uh, in the translation too. And uh, uh, of course, this was just like a, whatever a temporary um, uh, French translation, but that's how that's how it is. I think it's. Uh, um, I actually quite uh, um, quite like it, not knowing both texts. Uh, Well, uh, 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 actually not. I mean, he was, uh, I think he really got into the text as he was reading it. And uh, we were kind of discussing a lot of the lines, uh, wasting precious recording time, actually, which was very limited. Uh, so I was basically, you know, always, you know, trying to put him back on track. So, you know, trying to avoid him to make all these digressions. Um, and uh, now, strangely, what he was mostly, uh, what we mostly discussed is his pronunciation of French words. You know, in a strange way, he, he's, he's American, Miami or whatever, he, he's based in Florida. The way they pronounce French word, uh, I, I, French words, which are plenty in the film, um, is just wrong, you know. He would say moustache, or he would say boutique instead of boutique, or whatever. So, I, so in the end, it ended up being like a like a like a mini French lesson uh, for Iggy. But no, he was just being very appreciative, and every time he would uh, he would misunderstand or misread uh, one uh, a line, I would basically. Uh, refer to some uh, elements in his own music or in his own previous interviews, which I really analyzed very well beforehand. So, uh, so we, 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 I was very quick to put everything back on track. But um, he really didn't, uh, you know, it went, it went so quick. One session, uh, which was four hours, which is technically three hours without the breaks, and we recorded. 94 minutes of the narration in a longer version so it, he basically read everything once maximum twice so i wish i had one week with him to uh, do exactly what you suggested but it's just impossible with uh, not because of him but because of his overprotective managers i mean they're protecting him as if he was like uh, like a fragile flower I'm really, I'm really taking a, uh, I'm really taking a break and finally trying to get a little bit uh, uh, of, 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 of full nothing in my life, um, and it's, it feels really great. But of course, these, these, you know, damned ideas they keep, you know, uh, uh, showing up and, and, and stalking you. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. It's very difficult, but I'm trying to. Uh, to to create this this zone of uh, um, of nothing, and I hope that I will at least go through it, uh, you know, long enough to 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 recover physically from from this last film, and then to get into another cycle of madness.
um, anytime thereafter.